Okay, now we're muted, so we're good. So it should be streaming, right? Yeah. Okay. So it says live. Okay. Let's try it one more time here. Test, test, test. Yeah, it's working, Russ. When I talk, it's still. Yes.
on. Oh, that's off. All right. Good morning, everyone. Happy after Easter weekend. He is risen. He is risen indeed. So we're going to start with prayer here. And uh, just, uh, just turn our eyes upon him this morning. Yeah, so welcome church. Welcome wherever you are. Welcome to our service this morning amidst all the stuff we're all dealing with and, and, uh, and all the just the stuff. <laughs> uh, we invite you, Lord, because all this stuff is temporary, but you are eternal, and you've invited us into that eternity because of your great love. So, so Father God, we say thank you. We come to you with grateful hearts, with, with praise in our, in, our, in our hearts before you, Lord, because no matter what, we know that we have eternity with you, Jesus, because what you did for us. And we thank you, Lord, we can stand on your word that you say you will never leave us or forsake us, that you are with us, that you stick closer than a brother. So we thank you, Lord. We thank you for your spirit that you sent us to comfort us and help us and guide us, to speak to us, Lord. And so I pray, Lord, as we, as we enter in, as we worship and sing your praise and, and meditate on you, that you would speak to us and help us, Lord. Show us your ways. Show us your glory, Lord. As we read this, this morning in John chapter 17, I think is where we're at anyways, um, that you, your prayer for us was that we would be one in you, just as you are one in the Father, and that we would be be together. And, and so we thank you, Lord, and we look forward to that time. And so, yeah, let's worship him, church. Let's, let's sing his praise together to start with holy is the lord let me give me that guitar thank you lord sorry about that the technical difficulty. <laughs> All right. So, let's just turn our turn our eyes on him.
rest on his unchanging grace. Every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. My anchor holds within to you, Lord, when there's storms, you don't move. Things around us may move, and we may move, but you don't move. You would cause other things to move. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. You're everything that we need. May you be glorified as you prayed. Send your glory down, Lord. May we see your glory the glory of Jesus that the Father put upon the Son. I see the cloud I step in I want to see your glory like Moses did Flashes of light Rolls of thunder I'm not afraid Show me your glory Show me your glory Show me your glory Show me your glory Marred by your beauty, lost in your eyes. I want to walk in your presence like Jesus did. Your glory surrounds me, and I'm overwhelmed. I'm not afraid I'm not afraid I'm not afraid I'm not afraid Show me your glory Show me your glory face of the one that 
I love, long to stay in your presence. It's where I belong, I long to look on the face of the one that I love, long to stay in your presence. It's where I belong. Show me your glory. Show me your glory.
a sacrifice was made and then your fire came they knelt upon the ground and with one voice they praised a sacrifice was made and then your fire came they knelt upon the ground and with one voice they prayed you are good what we need. You're here today. Thank you, Lord. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, Bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Leave behind your regrets and mistakes. Come today, there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. sorrows and trade them for joy from the ashes a new life is born Jesus is calling oh come to the altar the Father's arms are open my forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Christ, oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide, forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus
praise you, Lord. Good morning, everyone. Hope you all had a good week. And if you didn't, it's the start of a new week. <laughs> That's right. And uh, God is with you every step of the way, no matter what you, you're going through or what we are going through in our world. God is with us, and he is victorious. And uh, thank you for the worship today, Russ and Jen and Treasure, Dwayne. <laughs> um, we just appreciate you all so much. And... Uh, that was wonderful. Right uh, it's just time of prayer now. Sure. Good. Just pray for Stan before he speaks. Just thank you, Lord, for your word. Your word is powerful. It is, it is sharper than, and it can cut, cut away things, Lord, in our lives, and it can bring, bring to life things that need to, to come to life, Lord. So we just pray for the word of God today as it is brought forth that you would just anoint Stand today, Lord. Pray that your glory would be upon him as he speaks, Lord. The glory of the Lord would shine down around about yes. him, Lord, as he speaks, Lord. Thank you, Lord. That his words would be words of life and of truth, that they would bring life to those that hear them, that the word of God will bring healing, the word of God will bring yes. strength, the That's word good. of God will bring healing, yeah. the, the word of God will bring joy, yes. peace. Just thank you, Lord, for your word today, and we just pray that you would just anoint it and use it for your glory, in Jesus' name, amen. Right on, amen. Thanks, Margaret. Thank you very much. Well, enjoyed the worship this morning. Treasure did a phenomenal job. She was our tech gal today, so that was awesome. And then uh, Jen on keys and, and uh, Russ uh, leading and playing the guitar. It all sounded just tremendous, uh, but more than sounded tremendous, it was an opportunity for us to connect with the Holy Spirit and with the Lord Jesus Christ and to love on our Father. And again, we were able to do that. So we appreciate our worship teams for facilitating that and making that happen today. So what a blessing. What a blessing. And then, you know, another day, a few days ago, uh, I uh, came up to the church and somebody had come in here and cut the grass. So I don't know who that was and I don't need to know who that was. Jesus knows who that was. So may the blessing of the Lord be on you. That was wonderful, fantastic. So thank you, whoever did that this week. It's nice to see the church grass looking so nice and to get that first cut in. Whoever does the first cut, that's the, that's the person that did most of the work, I'll tell you, during the cutting because I tell you, the first cut is always a bit harder than the, than the rest throughout the year. So thanks for that, much appreciated. Well, today, uh, as uh, we continue on in the Gospel of 90 Days, today is... Uh, uh, our final week on this series, the Gospel in 90 Days. It is hard to believe, but it is, uh, it is starting to wind down. We're in our final week of Scripture readings. Uh, John chapter 17, if you're tracking with us, is today, the 17th chapter of the Gospel of John. <clears throat> and so the agreement was that our sermons, our messages on Sunday, would be out of the Gospels as we went through 90 days of readings uh, and uh, spent this time together. So we'll see what happened next week. Having such a great time in the Gospels, might just keep preaching on it. We'll see. But uh, this will conclude uh, the Sunday messages focused with Gospel 90 Days and our readings uh, around Wednesday or Thursday will be done with that. And our life groups will be winding down as well, at least with this focus on Wednesday and on Thursday night. So today... Uh, the Gospel in 90 Days, I would like to speak to you again on this subject and really focus in on the Gospel of John. Uh, the purpose, as we went through the Gospel in 90 Days, was to see Jesus Christ in fresh ways, uh, to consider who Jesus Christ is, to consider how Jesus responded to people, to think about and meditate on what Jesus Christ was passionate about. Now, maybe those, some of those things were predominant in your mind. Maybe they weren't. But as you've read through, think about it now as you meditate, as we look in the message this morning. You know, 
who was Jesus? What, what did he say about himself? Uh, how did he respond to the people that came in his path? What do we see about the passionate heart of the Father as we see it manifested in the life of Jesus Christ? And another good question as disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ is to ask ourselves, so how do I respond to that? What is the Holy Spirit saying to me as my place and my response or what are maybe there's an action step or some area that we need to address in our lives or some area that we need to just walk into a little bit more allow the Holy Spirit to just allow that to 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 bubble forth in your heart as well and so the gospel of John as we look into this message this morning John focused very very strongly on the divinity of Jesus Christ every one of the Gospels has a little bit of a different theme and focus although of course telling us about the life of Jesus Christ and so John focuses in on his divinity and we see that from the very beginning John always is telling about us how that God became human and that Jesus Christ is the living God that's a focus with John. So he starts it off, right? In the Gospel of John, chapter 1. He starts off in verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then you drop down to the 14th verse of John, chapter 1, and we find it says this. John says this. He says, The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. And so what's John saying? He's saying he's God. He's saying Jesus Christ is all God. That's what he's saying. And then as we go through the Gospel of John, John just continues to bring this to our attention in different ways as he reflects on the life of Christ. And by the, the, the leading of the Holy Spirit, he puts pen to paper, and he writes out for us his focus as the Spirit of God put it on his heart of how, that, how that's important in our lives. And so he makes these powerful statements. We find these things in John. He makes these powerful statements. For example, in John chapter 8, and in the 58th verse, we find this amazing statement. See, see the, the religious leaders and the people, they, they, were, they were trying to figure out what Jesus was trying to say, and they didn't really believe him anyways, you know, but they're trying to figure out who he is or who he claims to be. And then he makes this powerful statement in John chapter 8, verse 58. He says, I tell you the truth. Before Abraham was born, I am. Well, they couldn't believe it, they, that he would say he was the great I am. I am, meaning the living God, the eternal God. And so they got the connection at that moment that Jesus was declaring to them who he was, the living God. And so they picked up stones. They were going to kill him. They were going to stone him to death because he, a man, claimed to be God. Well, he is God. That, that, then we move on further in John chapter 18, verse 5 and verse 6. Same kind of thing uh, where he calls himself the great I am again. It says, it says this in John chapter 18. Jesus said to them, I am he. Now let's paint the picture. This is in the Garden of Gethsemane, right? It's in the Garden of Gethsemane, and they had come to arrest Jesus Christ. And he said to them when they came to, to arrest him in the garden, whom do you seek? And their response was, Jesus of Nazareth. And so Jesus, in response to that, said, I am he. And when Jesus said to them, I am he, the Bible says they drew back and they fell to the ground. The sheer power of the Lord Jesus Christ saying who he was, the I am that I am, he said it within the integrity and the reality 
of who he was within the veil of his human flesh. He allowed that glory and that reality to just come out enough that, that, it, that they not only heard it, but it just overpowered them. And these men that had come to arrest him actually fell back and on the ground by the sheer power and authority as Jesus Christ declared, I am the living God. <clears throat> Powerful. And so Jesus is revealed to us in the Gospel of John as the I Am, as the living God, as God who came in human flesh. So that's profound. And so I'd like to take this time that I have with you this morning to look through the Gospel of John, as you've been reading in John, and talk about the seven different statements that Jesus made where he call himself I am and he links the fact and the reality that he is the I am of the burning bush see when he declared that and they all fell back he was using in that language the equivalent words to what was said in the Hebrew back in the Old Testament when when Moses approached Jesus when approached the living God at the burning bush and God said I am the I am I am, tell them that I am that I am has sent you, right? That's what Jesus was saying. Well, in the New Testament, as we look at this, there are seven statements in Gospel of John that link how the I am of the burning bush is within the person of who Jesus Christ is and how in each one of these statements, John points out to us some important aspect of how the I am, the Lord Jesus Christ, is personal to us and how he ministers to us how that is how that implication and that reality is to can touch our lives in different ways and so i'm glad he did that and so let's look at them so the first one we're going to go through all seven some we're going to hit kind of quick because the amount of time we have but the first one is jesus said i am the bread of life wow john chapter 6 and the 35th verse then jesus declared i am the bread of life he who comes to me will never go thirsty and he who believes in me will never be thirsty i didn't say that right did i let me say it again I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry. That sounds better. And he who believes in me will never be thirsty. So we notice that. I'm the bread of life. Come to me and you will never hunger. Isn't that something, eh? See, when you look at the whole context of that, uh, it's interesting when you read it and, and you just read it within the story. Of Jesus is such a master teaching. We find there had been the feeding of the 5,000, right? That had happened. Then he calmed the storm and people that he had fed, all those thousands of people, they came seeking him. And Jesus says to him, well, you seek me not because of the miracle, miracle but because, and the implications of the miracle, but you're, you're, you're following me and you've come to me here on the other side of the lake because I fed you and you were full. And, and then this, this ended up with this whole dialogue with Jesus Christ. And he said, well, you know, about the manna in the wilderness. And so Jesus from that continued to speak to them and he said, listen, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry. He's saying to them, really, if you read through those several verses in the chapter, John chapter 6, to make it as simple as possible, he is saying live your life with dependency on the Lord Jesus Christ. Depend on Him as your bread. Depend upon Him as the nourishment you need in your life. And so it says in John chapter 6, verse 56 and verse 57, eat, eat my body as your bread and, my, and drink my blood as your life. What is He saying? He's not saying to, 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 to literally eat His bread his life, his body, his flesh, his bread, and his, and his blood, his drink. He's not saying that at all. Look at the context. Look at the story. Read the paragraphs. What's he saying? He's saying, he's saying I'm, I'm your bread. 
I'm, I, I, he's saying to us, you must eat of me and drink of my life. You must, you, must, you must feed on the nourishment of my very reality, of the words that I speak, of the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life. That's what you need. That's what he's saying. He's saying, I'm your bread. Eat and drink of me. And so, as an example, we go to the Gospel of John in chapter 4, in verse 34. And, and, and you remember the story in John chapter 4, Jesus is at the well, right? And a woman comes middle of the day to get water. And Jesus sees her. And, the, and there's this amazing story as Jesus speaks to her about her need of the Lord. And, uh, and then he witnesses to her and, she, and she, she becomes awakened. And she goes back to her town to, to talk to her people about how she met Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And he's waiting because he knows she's coming back. And he's sitting there beside the well and the disciples come back. And they brought physical food for him because he knew he'd be hungry. And he responds to them and he said, my food, in John 4, 34, he says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. What's he saying? He's saying, I have another kind of food. The food you brought me will sustain me physically. But my food comes from the Father. I listen to him. I respond to him. I live within his presence. And I do what he says. My, my life is that my bread is to my food is to do what he told me to do. That's another way of saying what we're saying. See, Jesus said, I am your bread. I am the bread of life. All that is required to do is what he tells me to do. He brings me the nourishment that I need of the Holy Spirit. His nourishment is beyond anything else that we can have. So I am the bread of life. Then he goes on number two and he says, I am the light of the world. You know, any one of these particular statements we could spend a whole message on. They are so powerful to unpack. I'm just sort of covering them as we kind of take a big picture view of the Gospel of John, trusting and believing that you've been reading or that you will read through John and see these and allow the Holy Spirit to make them real to you. And so one of the things Jesus said, how the great I am touches your life is by recognizing God is your bread. God is your bread. Jesus is your bread. Now he says, here, I am the light of the world. When Jesus spoke again to the people in John chapter 8, verse 12, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but he will have the light of life. There it is again. And so he is our light. You know, the neat thing about this the fascinating thing about this story is it was set during the Feast of Tabernacles. We get this little digression in John chapter 8 where this woman is caught in adultery and brought before the Lord. And I'm not minimizing that. I'm just saying that was kind of placed in there in between the story of the Feast of Tabernacles. And John chapter uh, uh, 7, it was about, you know, drink of this river of life and all that becomes wells of life within you. That was at the same feast. And then as we move on into the feast into John chapter 9, we're finding, it, uh, finding one of the major things that took place during that time was that uh, the, there was this lighting up of giant lamps in the outside court or what became known as the woman's court within the temple. In the feast, a major thing that took place was they would, they would light up these huge lamps and the light would illuminate. And during the festival, the Feast of Tabernacles, it would, it would light up the temple area and people would start to sing and they would dance before God. And then they would take torches and they would light up the whole city with, this, with these torches as they thought about the light of God. It was a reminder in that day and age, it was a reminder within that culture that God had been with them in the wilderness. 
that he had led them as a pillar of fire by day and a cloud by day. But they, a cloud by, by day and a pillar of fire by night. They thought about that pillar of fire and how he led them through the wilderness, providing them with light. And so they would, they would react, reenact that in this way, remembering that during the Feast of Tabernacles. And Jesus said at this, this moment when they were lighting these candles and the whole city was being lit up, the temple was being lit up, Jesus said to them, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. But you know, that's more than historical. That, that is more than something that took place 2,000 years ago. Jesus is saying to you and I, something not just that breaches all the way back to the pillar of fire back in the wilderness when Israel walked through the, the desert areas, not just 2,000 years ago when, when this took place at the temple, but he's saying to you and I that just as I was with the people of God in the wilderness, and there was this light, a pillar of light. I want you to know that whatever wilderness you walk into in your life, I am the light of the world, and I am your light in whatever wilderness you find yourself walking through. He is saying, I am the light that comes into your captivity and sets you free and saves you from the bondage that has captivated you or that would captivate you i am indeed the light of the world you know uh, one of the big series of movies that's come out over the last couple of decades is the lord of the rings and in the one called the two towers there was a head elf her name was the lady of goldenwood and uh, those of you that are real big fans of that, you know, it was written by a, a very strong Christian man who wrote that series as a fictitious way of representing spiritual truth. But anyways, in that story, the Lord of the Rings, the, the two, tellers, two towers, the head elf, Lady of Goldenwood, gave a crystal to Frodo. And she made this amazing statement. It will shine still brighter when night is about you. May it be a light for you in dark places when all other lights go out. And I believe he was trying to say in cryptic form in the story, Tolkien was saying to us, Jesus Christ is the light when it is night about you. May he be your light in dark places when all other lights go out. Well, that's who Jesus is. I am the light of the world. I remember, uh, I'm old enough to remember Amy Grant when she was very popular in Christian circles. She's still out there, but I remember when she burst into the scene, and I still remember in 1986 when she decided to move <clears throat> not just in the Christian camp, <clears throat> excuse me, in culture, but to move out into the world, into other areas and other venues beyond the Christian scope. And she received a lot of, of uh, criticism, hurtful criticism. There was a lot of controversy about her moving out into that and starting to develop songs and sing songs that were not purely within the Christian context and culture. She was in Cincinnati at one time during that period, and she made this statement, which is very profound, talking about Jesus being the light. She said this, Some people think I should stand in the light and give my witness but i believe god has called me to stand in the dark and there give off my light i know there is danger in the dark but god's word has told me that i am all right as long as i don't lose sight of the light and friends that is profound god has called us to be grounded in his word, grounded in his presence, to keep our eyes on the light, to, to fellowship and assemble together as we can, and all of that. But listen, we need to remember Jesus said, I am the light of the world, and God has called us to be light in the world in which we live. Amy Grant got that right. And so Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. And so this morning, I want you to remember as we go through the Gospel of John, 
Jesus is your light. Remember that. He is your pillar of fire by night. That's who Jesus Christ is. Turn to the pillar of fire always. Let him be your light in dark times and in times that aren't so dark. Remember who the light is and he will illuminate. He will burn life and and, and burn not in the sense that it's painful, but burn in the sense of warmth into your heart and your life. Thirdly, I am the gate, the Bible says. And John says this, he keeps talking about how Jesus is God. And how we need to trust him, that he's the great I am. And so another thing he says in John chapter 10, he said a couple of statements about the I am. The I am that I am, as it says at the burning bush back in Exodus chapter 3. Here he says, I am is also, I am the I am. I am God. And one, one other way that this is very practical for your life, these are all very practical things Jesus is saying. One other practical aspect is that is, is I am is the gate. I am the gate. If you're reading King James, it'd be I am the door. But more modern translations, I think more accurately, are saying I am the gate. I am the gate. And so in, in the Passion Translation, in verse 7 of John 10, it says this, very cool. You know, I, I enjoy reading it in different translations. Sometimes it picks things up for me, right? I have my main one that I use, main, main one or two translations, but other ones bring colors to me. Well, the Passion Translation said this in verse 7 of John 10 about the gate. So Jesus went over it again. Aren't you glad Jesus does that, by the way, sidetrack? Side track, side note. Isn't that awesome? If you don't get it the first time, the Holy Spirit will speak to you again. If you don't get it the first time and you didn't get it, God will bring some other instrument, some other person, maybe a, a spiritual song or, or maybe a verse of Scripture or maybe a book you're reading or something. But God will bring, God's so gracious, isn't he? He'll give it to you again. And so Jesus went over it again, and he said this, I speak to you eternal truth. I am the gate for the flock, John 10, verse 7. You know, when, when God came to Moses at the burning bush, Moses appro approaches the bush. It's not being consumed. It's burning, flaring up, but it's not being consumed. So he approaches the burning bush. And God begins to speak to him out of the burning bush. And he says, I am that I am. When, at, when, when Moses said, whom shall I say sent me? Moses discovered something at the burning bush. Moses discovered that the gateway to fulfill his dream was through the great I am. That I am was his gateway. It was his gateway. Ever since he was a young man, his dream was that God would cause him to be the deliverer. He was concerned and consumed with his people being in captivity, right? He wanted to be their deliverer, and he tried to go about it. He went about it in the wrong way in his own human flesh, and he couldn't do it on his own. One day, 40 years later, here he is before the burning bush, and God opened the gate. God opened the gate, and in his time, he opens the gates. And he opened the gate to his dream that he could become to the deliverer. The deliverer. And God said, now is the time, Moses. Go deliver my people. And he said, whom shall I say sent me? Tell him what I am. I am the gate. I am that I am has sent you. Jesus Christ, is, we are being reminded of today, is the gate to your dreams. It is through him that you will find that fulfillment. In times when we try to make it happen, we find we fall or we get discouraged. But the Lord will energize. He will open the doors. I am the gate, he said. Jesus further, as we look at this in John chapter 10, and he talks about the sheep and the sheepfold and the pen where they were held and taken care of and protected. Jesus is speaking of an abundant life and a full life. He goes on in the Passion Translation in the ninth verse there, and he says this. I am the gateway. To enter through me is to experience life, freedom, and satisfaction. 
Now, doesn't that sound fantastic? That's tremendous. He says, to enter through me is to experience life, freedom, and satisfaction. Look at it in your own translation. And now look at it and think about those dynamics that are in there. That is who he is. He is the gateway into life. He is a gateway into freedom. He is a gate. He says they will come in and they will go out. What's he talking about? He's talking about freedom. He's talking about satisfaction. He's talking about life. We have the wonderful privilege, guys, of freedom to experience the rich pastures of what the Lord has, the blessings of God, the grace of the living God, because he's the great shepherd. But he's not just a great shepherd. He's the good shepherd, and we'll talk about that in a min minute. You know, think about the story. You know, sometimes I think when we read the scriptures, it's good for us not just to think about the verse, but think about the story around it. And so, what's the story? Well, the story is going on here. He's just healed a guy that was born blind. John 9, remember? The chapter before. He just healed this guy. He's born blind. He's, he's limited to begging. I mean, everybody, you know, people ridicule him. Even the disciples are caught up in the facade. They, they walk over to him and they said, Jesus, so, you know, who sinned? Was it this man or his parents? Don't you know you're talking to a human being who's blind and now you're going over to him and looking at him as if he's not even there, that he doesn't even exist, and you're accusing him and says, how, how would you like that? He says, hey, Jesus, this guy right here, was it him that sinned? Or was it his parents that he's blind? You know, like he already feels his limitations. And then you, oh, talk about lack of caring. Thankfully, the Lord continued to work with those guys. And they, they got it right. And the Spirit of God came into them. And they began to experience the reality of Jesus in their life and the presence of God. They were transformed. But, but at this point, that's what happened. See, the, the man was all bound up, right? He couldn't fulfill his dreams. There was things, I'm sure, that were in his heart that he wanted to do in his life. He, he wanted to serve. There was perhaps a career he wanted to have. Maybe he wanted to have a family, you know, and, and all of these different things. And he couldn't do it because he was blind. And everybody was down on him. Well, Jesus healed him and he set him free, right? And so he's the one who heals the blind. He takes care of the outcasts, the condemned, and those that are second class. That's what he's talking about. I am the gate. I am the gate to your freedom and to your life, to your satisfaction. That's who Jesus is. And then he, John chapter 10 and verse 10 says, you know, in, in my translation, it says, I've come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. The message translation adds this to it through Eugene Peterson. He says, I came that they can have real and eternal life, more and better life than they ever dreamed of. Well, isn't that true of that blind man? More life than he ever dreamed of. And so he is the gate into more dreams, more life, more reality for you. Oh, I love Jesus. Oh, he's the great I am. Oh, there's more here. And so number four, he is the I am the, the, that is the good shepherd. And that just, look at it, it just folds out here in this whole chapter in John chapter 10. He said in John 10 verse 11, the NIV says this, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. That's who the good shepherd is. Jesus is emphasizing a few things here. And one of the things he's focusing on and the, that worked in my language and in my heart as spoke to me yesterday, I was thinking about this again, is Jesus Christ is saying to me, I'm your protector. I'm your protector. He's saying, Stan, I laid my life down for you. I'm not a hireling. I'm not on, on salary. I don't protect the sheep because I get a paycheck. Uh, I don't do it out of self-interest or to provide an income for me. I am your shepherd. I will lay down my very life for you. And he did. And he did. I am identifying myself with you. And Jesus is emphasizing, I am the good shepherd. He is your protector. He is my protector. 
you know, this was very significant in this, in this, in this, uh, in this environment where there were sheep and shepherds. You know, as darkness fell down upon Palestine, upon Israel, upon the Middle East, predators were lurking and ready to come. And you know, in those days, I was looking it up, you know, there, if you go back into history through the Middle East and you go in, in, in that, they, they had all kinds of wildlife in those days. There was leopards and there was wolves and there was lions and bears. That's right, I heard that. Somebody said bears. Yes, and bears all, and so many more. Hyenas, all kinds of different predators were out there. And then there was the human predator thieves as well and so it was a very uncomfortable time for the sheep when darkness fell but jesus said listen i am the good shepherd i will protect you i will lay my i will risk my very life and put me in harm myself in harm's way to make sure the wolves and the leopards and the cheetahs and the bears cannot get to you that the thieves cannot overwhelm you that's what jesus is saying to us today i'm the good shepherd and today we need to remember that jesus is saying to you i'm the good shepherd and i know we live in a world and there's different types of pains we go through i get that and loss and pandemics and all that but i want you to know that he is your good shepherd and he will see you through and he is watching over you. He really is. He's the same one who is good. He is a gracious God. He is the one who bent down before a woman in John chapter 8 who was caught in adultery and rode in the sand. And when everybody else, when everybody else was condemning her. And uh, on Wednesday night at Life Group, my brother Bob. That's the cool thing about Zoom, you know. You can be in Port McNeil or you can be in Kelowna. Hi, Bob. You can be in Kelowna. He's probably watching. And Bob joined us from there. And Bob said over in Kelowna, he said on Zoom to us on Wednesday night, he said, what happened to the man? Where's the guy? You know, they brought the woman, but they didn't bring the man. Right? And I thought, good, good, astute observation, right? But they weren't interested in that. They were just trying to use her as a means to the, an end to trip up Jesus Christ. They didn't care about her. How sad and pathetic is that? They wanted to inflict harm upon her. They wanted her stoned. But Jesus, her protector, in a very unique way, protected her by kneeling down in front of her, saying, he that was out stone, well, he without sin cast the first stone. And then he just was patient and he waited. And they all left. And then he looked at her. He made eye contact with her. He looked at her and he says, where is everybody? He says, well, they're all gone. And, he's, and he says, well, I don't condemn you either. I do not condemn you. Go and sin no more. You are free. And he expressed the heart of love of the Lord. See, God is a God of love and care. And then there's three more. He's the good shepherd. Yes, he's the bread of life. He's the light of the world. He is the gate. But as we go through the Gospels and as we pull this all together for the 90 days in the Gospels, we find that Jesus said other things about himself. It says, he said these things. In John chapter 11, verse 25, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. Lazarus had just died. He, and, and Jesus waited four days and he came back. And Martha approaches Jesus. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and life. And she said, yes, I know, Lord. One day Lazarus will rise. But Jesus is saying, yes, that's right, you got it right, but there's something else here. My resurrected life can impact you today. And as a demonstration of that, watch this. Roll a stone away. He goes, roll a stone away. Lazarus, come forth. Because his life 
is for tomorrow when we're with him in eternity, but his life and resurrection empowers us and impacts us now. He grants life to us. And then he said a little bit later in John chapter 14, verse 6, I'm just doing these last couple a little quicker, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come unto the Father but through me, right? You know, he said that in light of Thomas. And again, looking at the story surrounding it. Uh, Thomas reacted to Jesus. Jesus was talking about, I go to prepare a place for you. I'm uh, going to go. I'm making special rooms for you. I'll be, I'll, I'm leaving you. Going away for a period of time. And he says, and I'm going to make you a home in heaven. It's going to be a special place for you. For each one of you. Special rooms for each one of you. Special places for each one. I have you in my mind. And Thomas is overwhelmed by this. He's been listening to Jesus and, and he, he, he's having a hard time grasping it. And he just said, Lord, how can that be? You know, we, we don't know the way. We don't know how to do that. We don't know how to follow you. And Jesus just looked at him with empathy and compassion and deep love. And he, he just said to him, he said, listen, Thomas, listen, guys, everyone listening to this conversation. He says, he says, listen to me. He says, the key is me, Jesus said. I am the way. I am the truth. I am life. Just trust me. Just believe me. I'll get you there. And that's all we need to do, right? Jesus saying, it's through me. It's through me. I'm the way. I'm the way because I'm the truth. I'm the life. And then one more he said is, is in John chapter 15, verse 1, just as, as we, we look at one more. He said this in John 15, verse 1. I am the true vine. Well, how cool is that? I am the true vine. How impacting is that? All of these have implications for my life. Jesus said that, but Jesus throughout the Gospels is modeling this. Jesus modeled this. We see him continually moving, and he, and he draws attention to that, that he says that he was drawing life from the Father, that even though he was the living God, he chose to submit himself and yield to the Father, and for those 33 or so years on earth, I will, he said, I will not draw upon my inerrant inner Godhood of Godhood who, of who I am. I am going to live my life like a man or a woman walking on this earth filled with the Holy Spirit. I am going to limit myself to that. And everything he did, he drew his life from the Father, didn't he? When he saw the Father doing something, he did that. When he saw the Father's will was to heal someone, he healed them. When he thought the Father was saying, touch that person's eyes, he did that. He lived his life. He would, he would get up early in the morning or go out late night and just talk to the Father. What was he doing? He was drawing life and energy and strength and revelation and power and healing flowing into his life from the very presence of the living God. And now Jesus is saying to us, his children, to the disciples, that who we are. He's saying, he said, as I drew life from the Father, he's saying, I am the true vine. I'm your vine. You're the branches. You're the branches. It says in the message translation of John 15 in the fifth verse, as you go through these several verses, John 15, it says, when you're joined with me and I with you, the relation, intimate and organic, the harvest is sure to be abundant. The harvest in your life. I've got to read it again. When you're joined with me and I with you, the relation intimate and organic, the harvest is sure to be abundant. He's just saying, we're joined together. Flow, let your life be connected to me. And the fruit will come. And so as I close this morning, He is, Jesus Christ, is and has been revealed to us in the Gospels and in the Gospel of John so strongly that He is the God of the burning bush. And He, the God of the burning bush, the great I am that I am, Jesus Christ, will light His fire in you. He will be your bread. He will be your light. He will be your gate. He will be all of these things. He will be your life. He will be your shepherd. All of that. 
All of that. He will be your way. He is your vine. Moses faced Sean in Exodus chapter 3 when he saw the great I Am. May you see the great I Am today. My prayer in a moment for you is that you will see Him, Jesus in fresh ways the apostle paul he prayed lord i want to know jesus i want to see him i want to see more may you see more i pray and so i pray for you now i pray that as you've gone through the gospels as you've been listening to these messages on the gospels as you've heard the testimonies based on the gospels as we've been talking about jesus as the holy spirit has been talking to you about jesus in this message and in other messages and thoughts or in your life things that you've read and heard about jesus christ i pray this morning that the great i am who is jesus christ will be revealed to you in a greater way right where you live right what you need that he will grant you freedom grace life what you need this morning in the name of Jesus. Be at peace in Jesus' name. Receive healing in Jesus' name. Receive encouragement now in Jesus' name. This morning before church, we prayed. Someone prayed. We we're praying. May hope be refreshed and renewed. Now, it's already in there, but may it be energized today through Jesus. He's the gate to that too. In the name of Jesus Christ, that and so much more. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thanks for listening to us this morning. Amen.